the more I learned about medicine, the good and the bad about medicine, the more I learned about real estate, the good and the bad about real estate, I realized that there's a way we can combine the two. And I love uh, teaching about house hacking. And it's great to see when you like follow up with them after a year or two and they're like, this has changed my life. Welcome to the Physician Pharmacist Podcast, a show designed to shed some light on a very unusual pathway into medicine. I'm your host, Nathan Gartland, and I'm a licensed pharmacist and fourth year medical student. I'm also the author of PharmD to MD and the owner of the Physician Pharmacist Company. As this podcast has grown, we've had the tremendous opportunity to broaden our scope and explore other non traditional healthcare careers. Tune in to hear from our non traditional experts serving at the frontier of medicine, technology, and innovation. Tonight, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Ayush Gupta who is a pediatric emergency medicine physician at LCMC, a New Orleans-based hospital system. He also spends his free time as a real estate-focused entrepreneur that specializes in empowering medical professionals to seek out their own financial freedom. Through his company, MD House Hacking, Dr. Gupta is bringing the benefits of real estate investing to the surface. For our listeners who are interested in personal finance or real estate, this is going to be a terrific episode that you're not going to want to miss. Thank you for being on the show today. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super excited for this episode. I, I really love like learning about real estate, and I think our listeners are going to really enjoy what you have to say to us today. I love talking about real estate and also learning about it at the same time. So I'm happy uh, to be on here and provide any information and as much value as I can today. Fantastic. But aside from the real estate, you're obviously a physician at this point in time. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your life was like prior to getting involved in real estate and prior to medical school? Yeah. So I was uh, born, raised in India. So I'm not from the US. I was born, raised in India. Um, uh, very loving parents, one sibling, my dad's a doctor. Uh, I think the the common thing among Indian family is your kids are going to be either a doctor or an engineer. You know, that's a common saying. Uh, that's how I was raised. And my brother did not become a doctor. So I knew when I was like, he's, he's six years older than me. So I knew when I was like 10 or 12 years older that I'm going to be a, a, a physician. You know, I'd love <laughs> to play. They they put a stethoscope in my hand when I was a baby. So that was like grilled into it. I used to go to my dad's clinic a lot. So life was, uh, we lived in a big joint family. You know, it's not like a three people, four people household. So we used to have like 30, 40 people in, in a building that we lived wow. together. So it's a great, different, very, very different uh, upbringing than what I'm used to now. So, um, yeah, I was uh, in India. You go to um, high, you go directly to high med school from high school. So I was 18 when I entered med school and uh, it was, uh, you know, you're very immature uh, when you get into med school, uh, it's not easy to get into a uh, cadaver lab at 18 and see and cut uh, bodies and just be okay with that. But, you know, that's how the training system is in India. So we, we, we have a five and a half year training. You skip college, so your med school is a little longer. So for me, my journey basically starts from there. Uh, I was 20, 24 when I flew into U.S. And that's in New York. And I did my residency for three years, fellowship for three years. In residency in pediatric and fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine before I moved to New Orleans, uh, where, I, where, I, where I live now, and I work as a full-time attending. Wow. I, I think that's so interesting, too, that they kind of put you in medical school right off the bat without any undergrad experience. Um, you, you kind of mentioned like the maturity aspect of it. And I was thinking back, like, what was I doing at 18 years old? I don't think I was ready for medical school. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, um, it's not it's not easy. I, I'll tell you that. And I, and I think the, the other part, it's so competitive to get into med school. I think the year that I got in, um, there were like 500,000 people who applied for med school and 1,000 got into med school. So there are people who are trying for years and years and years and years and Sometimes they're like 25 when they get into med school because they've been trying for five to seven years to get into med school. Um, but it's a whole different process and system. So, yeah, I mean, you go around and, and we're kids when we're in med school, to be honest. It's not easy to mm -hmm. uh, deliver babies when you're 21 years old because that's <laughs> what you do in India in med school. Wow. I mean, talk about clinical exposure right there. So that, that's yeah. incredible. <laughs> Very hands-on. Uh, 
Yeah. V very hands on. Um, so really cool. And so you obviously then went to residency, you got through medical school and is that what brought you to the United States or did you have family over here originally or? No, no, man. I can't, came by myself. I had no family, no friends. I didn't know anybody. Uh, <laughs> I had an address in my, in my pocket that my family found of a distant relative. And I landed in, in JFK on, uh, on June 20th, 2012. And, uh, I still remember because it's it's very distinct. I came with an address. I, it was New York, JFK, yellow cabs, no Uber, no Lyft during those times, you know. Mm -hmm. So you 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 stand in the line, but interestingly, none of the cab drivers want to take me to the address because they said that address doesn't exist. So for me, it was very interesting the first first hour or so because I tried like ten cabs and they said no. So I went back inside JFK. My phone's my phone was dead. It was like a fourteen hour flight journey from India directly when you come to the US to JFK. And then um, at that point, I was sitting on, on my suitcase at that point, uh, just sitting over there at the airport and deciding I had $1,000 in my pocket. I'm like, what should I do? I was seriously contemplating about taking the flight back to India at that point, because, wow. you know, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't know. I've, that was the first time I've been outside India in my life. So yeah, it was a very interesting transition. Finally, like, you know, I took the courage of two two options, you know, either I go back to India, right? I try another cab. So I, mm -hmm. I was like, I took a deep breath, went out, tried another cab. That guy drove me through all five boroughs in New York and finally took me to Long Island where that address was. And, uh, you know, it's like an angel. And uh, funny, uh, fun fact, he did not turn his meter on. So I don't know how much of an angel he was, but he was, uh, whatever, <laughs> you know. Hey, I guess first your luck time. turned around there. <laughs> yeah. It was a very interesting first few hours of landing in the U.S. before I started residency. Yeah. Yeah. So you're really a trailblazer when it comes to kind of just like <laughs> going out there and I don't know, just I don't think I'd have the courage to do that. That's that's incredible. And so you obviously got into residency um, in New York City. And mm -hmm. so what was that experience like for you? Like, how was it kind of like contrasted to like what you had been like learning in, in India? Yeah, very different, you know. Um, it is very well taught, very well uh, run residency programs in the in the U.S. as compared to in India. In India, it's like all bedside clinical, long hours, um, which is great. You know, you get very, very tough and you, you have a lot of good clinical experience. In the U.S., you have teaching hours. Uh, by the time I came, ACGME had so many rules in terms of mm -hmm. how many night shifts and 24-hour calls people can do. I think when I was still in residency, we could still do 24 hour calls. So we were still doing that, but it was getting better. Um, I think overall training was amazing. It was just a whole different aspect of um, learning bedside manners. You know, that was my biggest thing. You know, the first first week I remember, I didn't know how to put the uh, the the side of the bed down. I had a baby. I was pediatric. I had a baby in the crib. I could. I didn't know how to take the crib down. So I was mm -hmm. reaching from the top, trying to examine the babies. And they were like, what is he doing during the rounds? And then I'm like, I don't know how to take that out. So, you know, all those like minute details that people take it for granted are, were like, just not, uh, not, not something that we learned in India growing up. So it was very interesting. Like the, I, I enjoyed it a lot, you know, in residency, I put all my, all my time into learning the culture of of us but also like enjoying residency make making a ton of friends and uh just immersing me into this uh different background that i came into that's that's awesome yeah and i'm curious to know why did you pick uh pediatric to, to anybody who's listening you know when i i talk to med students every day and i ask them one of the commonest question or even pre-med what do you want to be you know what kind of physician mm -hmm. you want to be uh and i i tell them my experience like when i started med school uh my first two years i wanted to be a forensic pathologist uh, the next year, I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. And then my final year, I thought, no, um, I wanted to be a pediatrician. So one thing I want to just tell back, it keeps changing. Like for anybody who's trying to get into residency, you know, if you think getting into med school, like first year, you know what you want, you'll probably change during your med school because you learn so many different things. So when I learned during my med school, all these different kind of um, teaching and learning and all all different practices of watching attendings, how much time they spend with their patients, bedside, what patient impact you can do. Pediatrics call, call was the biggest calling for me. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had, I had a very uh, sick cancer pediatric patient in India that I was taking care of. And one day I go in and she wasn't there. So it, it kind of made a big impact on me. Like, you know, we can make 
a massive change in their life if you do something right for them. Mm-hmm. That was one of the biggest reasons. Uh, then, to, to be honest, for an IMG, international medical graduate, when you come from another country to the US, you're, the number of things you can do is actually narrowed down. It's not easy to get dermatology. It's not easy, easy to get like orthopedic or, or be a surgeon. You can be that. I don't want to say you cannot be that. It's just really, really tough, mm-hmm. especially during my time when it was so competitive. I think it's even competitive now. But during that time, I would say pediatric internal medicine, family medicine, some of these things like psych were, were the big things that IMGs were doing. And for me, it was easy. I already liked pediatrics a lot. Those are the two big reasons. One, I like it. Second, uh, that's how it worked when I was coming to the U.S., in all honesty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I kind of had a similar experience like that, too, where I went into medical school thinking I was going to do internal medicine, and now I'm yeah. doing anesthesia. So it's yeah. uh, it's kind of funny there how it go. all switches around. Cool, cool. And so you obviously progressed through residency at this point. And when did you decide that you wanted to do pediatric emergency medicine? And uh, for our listeners who might not be super familiar with this, pediatric residency training is three years. But then to do emergency medicine on top of that, that's an additional three-year fellowship. So that's that's no joke. Um, so what made you kind of make that decision? Um, yeah, again, like like in med school, you go through the different kind of trainings in pediatrics. And I had the same thing. I started with pediatric endocrinology, you know, um, <laughs> which which uh, the endocrinologist was very, very honest to me. And she was like, if you want to tr- have trouble mm-hmm. finding a job, then do pediatric endocrinology. Otherwise, do something else. She was very honest about it. it probably, probably too, because it's tough to get a full-time job as a pediatric endocrinologist. But then you go through the training, you know, I was always between PICQ and PZR, those pediatric ICU and PZR. I loved uh, procedures and bedside and just impacting. Like, I think it just came from med school. I just wanted to make an impact quick. Like, that was the big things that I liked a lot. Um, And then I chose pediatric ER just because more of a lifestyle thing apart from PICQ. PICQ, you you can be on call, right? In pediatric emergency medicine, you do your 12, 13, 14 shifts, whatever you're, dis- you're assigned to do, and you go home. You're never on call. You don't carry your pager. Obviously, you go in to mm-hmm. teach the residents and med students between your shifts. But that kind of freedom, I always enjoy traveling. And that was one of my big passion. I still is. So I wanted to have that ability to do, suppose I can bunch like seven days on, a couple of days off, six days on, and do my entire shift and then travel for two weeks out of the country if I wanted to. So I still do that a bunch and pediatric emergency actually allows that pediatric ICU or other subspecialty when you own your own clinic, those don't allow me to do that. So, uh, the lifestyle was great. Uh, the pay is obviously decent. It's very competitive. That's that, that lifestyle mm-hmm. actually puts into a most competitive pediatric subspecialty and, uh, not easy for an IMG to get in, but uh, I guess I was lucky or just had, had the stars falling in the right direction and and got into pediatric emergency medicine. I enjoyed the fellowship a lot. It was a lot of fun. Wow. So I mean, that's incredible that you were able to to kind of, I never really thought about the fact that it is the lifestyle feature. Uh, like I did a rotation in pediatric emergency medicine. So I, I think I have like a, it was pretty cool to actually have the opportunity to see the work that you do. And it's incredible. I mean, you're dealing with some of the sickest patients in the hospital and you like the, obviously the most of the time children might not be able to communicate with you, especially in like neonates. And so it's really like you're solving a puzzle. And I I thought it was just a very unique and interesting patient population to work with on top of, like you're saying, the, the lifestyle that comes along with it. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That challenge still, still there, you know, you will still go through the process in which uh, you'll have a two month old come to the ER and can't talk. And it's just like, doing stuff that you don't expect them to do and you have to figure it out. Um, and that can be like, and you can take that to other aspects of your life. You know, that, that, that cool challenging thing, you can take that into uh, anything else you, you're trying to build up. Like, for example, if you're doing a podcast or somebody's doing a real estate business or other uh, avenues in, um, in life, apart from just medicine, it kind of translates pretty well in that. Of course, of course. And speaking about like the patient population as well, like I I remember from my experience that pediatric patients, like especially, you know, the the younger they are, like their condition can turn very, very quickly. Like it's not like the, you know, adult that'll sit in the ED for six plus hours before they become fully septic. Pediatric patients, you got like 30 to 60 minutes before like things are in dire uh, circumstances. So I I just want to say like that, I think that you, what you guys do is amazing. So I think it's really cool. Yeah. And 
you know, if any med student or any like person is thinking about doing pediatric, one of the biggest satisfaction you'll have is when a kid, you ask the kids, what do you want to be? And they tell you, I want to be like you, you know, or you, they tell your parents that, hey, I want to be like him when you, when you leave the room. That is a satisfaction you can't get when you're treating a 65-year-old thing. We talk a lot about burnout stuff, but that's the one which is anti-burnout. Helps you to keep going. I love it. And so kind of transitioning now to real estate, which is, you know, kind of the primary discussion of what we're going to talk about today. When did you initially take an interest in real estate? Yeah, so uh, 2019, I graduated, you know, I was about to do mm -hmm. what every, almost every doctor who graduates does. You had so much of delayed gratification. What do you want to do when you graduate? You want to buy a nice car? You want to buy a nice house? You waited for like, <laughs> what, 12 years of your life to do? So I was on the verge of doing the same thing. I came to New Orleans. I started looking at this nice single family house. They have like beautiful houses in New Orleans. Tall ceilings, nice old architecture. It was great. However, I got lucky or unlucky, whatever. The COVID hit in 2020 in March. And New Orleans was one of the biggest areas, uh, like right after Mardi Gras. So we had a lot of population that got affected. So everything was shut down and you can't see anything. Um, it was good because we, we got good exposure to sick patients. However, the challenge that happened was uh, when I saw my mentors and attendings at different hospitals who were doing pediatric emergency medicine, not having enough patients getting furloughed. And uh, at that point, I realized, you know, medicine, I thought was the safest avenue. You know, you've worked 50 years, 15 years to get here. You'll be fine. You're going to be fine living past whatever time you want to. You're going to keep having a job. But then something like COVID hit and somebody who's like 50 year old or 45 year old is losing their job and not getting paid. And you see them struggling to pay their mortgage next month. And I was like, this doesn't sound right. And if it can happen to somebody who has been in this for 30 years, there's no reason why it cannot happen to me. So that's what changed my mindset a little bit about uh, investing into other aspects. So I started reading, learning a lot about real estate investing. I saw what other people were doing. Uh, and I think the biggest thing, the biggest difference, which I felt now that I can look back five years, four years before, like in 2020, the biggest difference was I just took action on it. I just didn't kept reading about it, but I was like, okay, I got to do it, you know? So uh, mm -hmm. a lot of us just think about those as risks and don't take action, but those more are opportunities and which are given to us to take action on. Wow. So, I mean, it sounds like you had a pretty profound experience with kind of seeing, obviously, with COVID, all the, the trauma and stuff that came from that, but also like the way that it impacted hospital workflow and the need for physicians at the times. And I, I recall it too, just like you like you were mentioning, where the hospital units were closing down and people were like losing their jobs and being furloughed, like yeah. you said. Yeah, I think because of this exposure, you went and thought to yourself, I need to diversify at this point. I need to find some other avenues that I can kind of shore up my, my finances, like you're saying. Um, to and you found real estate obviously and we were talking about this before we even started the interview like the great irony of that in healthcare is that like a lot of healthcare professionals are very high earning individuals yet very few of them actually concern themselves with how to invest the capital that they generate so what would you say to these you know individuals about you know saying that they're too busy to learn about finance um, like what would you say to them to encourage them to even consider real estate in the first place so there's like so many I have so many things that I can say about it, but I'll say that, you know, the, the three common things that people do uh, after graduating training is uh, buy a house, buy whole life insurance. Uh, and then number three would be like invest in 403B, 401K, some kind of retirement account, you know, mm -hmm. none of them is going to, all of them, if you think about it, is more of a liability than an asset right now. Your house is not paying for you. You're 403, B, 401k, you can't access it at 59 and a half years of age. And um, your life insurance is for somebody after, after you die. And I'm not saying those are bad things to do. I'm saying those are things that can be done, but you need to put in work to live right now. When people say they don't have time to, real estate, to do real estate or to do any other thing, it's basically they are ignoring the fact that this is going to cause them eventually a burnout and not having other avenues is going to cause them the stress and uh, just lead, lead it down the wrong path, you know? So if you really want to take care of yourself, if you really want to enjoy your life right now, 
you need to put in time to do other things you know you you will not be you're not taking risk isn't about being reckless you know it's about like being courageous and a lot of people um don't take that courage it, the magic begins once you start start taking that risk so that's what i would tell people that don't think about it as a risk think about it as an opportunity be courageous and and see the magic happen of course. And I think a lot of people are scared of like the unknown. Um, but a lot of that, like we're, we're good at studying things. We're, we're yeah. physicians, we're doctors. We, all we do is, you know, read books. So there's a million books out there that's available to learn about these different avenues. And so I, I don't think there's really any excuses not to do it. And I, I think that's so interesting. And what you're kind of like we're discussing there too, is like what, um, I'm not sure if you've ever read the white coat investor, but basically what they recommend is to, you know, ne- the only thing, like if I was to summarize the entire book in, you know, a couple, one or two sentences, it would be the second you graduate residency, live like a resident for at least <laughs> one to two years and pay off all of your rent, or, you know, pay off all of your debts, minimize the student loans and obviously purchase assets. Like you're saying, yeah. don't buy liabilities, like would, would be like the $2 million house. The second you graduate yeah. buying the, you know, $50,000 BMW, like just Drive the Camry for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I have spoken to James. I've been on this podcast before. I have the book right behind me. And you're right. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think it's like a herd mentality. I'll be honest to say. If you, I'll, I'll tell you like there, if there's like 30 people in my ER right now, physicians work, pediatric emergency medicine, and uh, everybody sees what everybody else is doing. It's, it's the, and they want to keep following their own. The, the, the path before. Nobody's setting a good path to see what kind of lifestyle could come if you do other things. And uh, now I'm like four years into this and I, I think people are seeing my path. I'm cutting down my hours a little bit. And uh, I think I think people are getting more and more aware as healthcare is causing more burnout among physicians. I think people are getting more aware about other avenues to do. So there's no ma- value of money once you're dead. You know, uh, there's this there's this great book, um, Die with Zero. I don't know if you've heard about it, but amazing book. I should I think everybody should read it. And it's all about like what you can do now. You know, if we all live for like 60 years old. When are we going to retire? 65 years old. You don't know what's going to happen when 65, if a stock market crashes and your retirement account is cut into half. I actually saw that happening in 2020. Like there are people who were planning mm-hmm. to retire and they could see that 401k dropped to half. And now the mm-hmm. lifestyle you were planning to live, you can't live. And the second thing that happens is if you want to, if you want to do a, like a crazy hike or a crazy tour or go to Patagonia, for example, and do like a 10 day trek over there, you can't do when you're like 80, 75, you know, your knees are not going to allow you to do that. Maybe, maybe 1% of the people will, but most people won't. It's a tough flight to fly for 18 hours straight, you know? So mm-hmm. Um, you can do those things right now. So I, I, use, I really am a big proponent of doing the stuff, using that money, using those investments right now to do the things and taking mini retirements. You know, take a month off when you're like in your second year of attending life and then take another month off when you're like fourth year or something like that. And then do these fun stuff. And it doesn't need to be traveled. You know, it can be like just sitting at home and, and enjoying with your family. Uh, you, you don't have to do like extraordinary stuff, but just these are good ways to like get your mind ready for everything you do in medicine. Exactly. We invest so much time into our careers that I think, you know, you're you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't invest in what your own interests are too. Yeah. You can, you can always create an identity much bigger than being a medical professional. Of course, of course. And so speaking of that identity, I guess, like, can you tell us a little bit more about like your first real estate deal? Yeah. So um, it's a four unit building. Uh, So I used to live in New Orleans. I used to rent an apartment and um, I used to rent it for $2,300 a month. Then I went ahead and bought a four unit building and uh, I put in like 3.5% down because I plan to live in one of the units. And then I rented out the other Mm -hmm. three units. As I was, as I moved in, I started to renovate each unit. So I had to put very little down because it's 3.5% down. And then I had mm-hmm. one tenant move out, renovated the unit, put another tenant with higher paying rent and did that for all the units. And then basically what it did is, so you increase the value of the property. So I bought the property for $650,000. After I did all the renovation and work and I refinanced it within like six months, I increased the value to $1.1 million. 
and that you can refinance out of the FHA loan and you get your all, all the money back. I use a private lender. I really didn't have that much money to, to go out and renovate all these properties. I took a lender who paid me all these things. I paid them out. I got all the money back that I used for my own investment, the 3.5% down payment that I put in. And then I lived over there for free. I used to pay $2,300 for rent. Now I was making $1,000 to live over there after paying all the expenses and mortgage. So, um, yeah, it was a great first deal. I, I think I, I, it was just because it, there was a lot of hiccups. It sounds super easy and super fun. Um, there was a lot mm-hmm. of ups and downs through this, but six months, eight months, and now that I'm like four years, five years out of it, I, it's like, it feels amazing. I think it was a great, great start. The, the, the best part is like, because you live in the property, once you refi out of it, you can actually take a home equity line of credit up to 90%, up to 100%. Mm-hmm. What it does is like a revolving credit card, which you don't have to pay any interest, any taxes on, or any any principal on, unless you take the money. So I use that HELOC and started buying properties other other places and then refinanced it and paid off my HELOC. And I kept doing that. And it is, it's fun. Yeah, I think that's the big, like, you know, kind of keeping things like general in the sense that like for our listeners is that, you know, you bought these assets that are cash flowing for you while you are sitting here at this moment. And in the background, you've built these systems that are going to be generating this income for you when you're not working, when you're on vacation, wherever you go, so that you aren't stuck independent on your job. And so speaking on this deal that you you mentioned, and people say like, oh, 3.5% down. How did you how did you pull that off? I thought you need 20% down for a conventional loan. So I'm assuming you did FHA yeah. loan, which is available. Yep. The stipulations, I believe, and I've never done one before, but stipulation to be you know, you have to live in the property for one year. Is that Correct. right? And then there's also PMI. Correct. But for a six hundred thousand dollar house, three point five percent down, that's that's hardly anything. You know, that's like twenty seven yeah. grand or whatnot. Yeah. So I mean, that's not that much money when it comes to purchasing of cash flowing, you know, enterprise. So I think that's just so cool that you were able to come to the realization that like this is the way to financial freedom. And then that way I can focus on being in medicine and enjoying what I do every single day and not be stressed about money. Yeah. And you know, that was me not knowing a lot about real estate. I I would probably say I I read and learned about real estate for two or three months before I jumped into that deal. Now I know a lot more and I, there are people who come to me all the time and they're like, they don't have that 10, 20, $30,000 to put as a down payment. Uh, Like as if you're a med student or if you're starting out, if you're pharmacy student, whatever, you do not have that much money to put down. There's like so many creative ways to do it. You can do a portfolio loan with banks. Like this place that I'm living in right now, I put 0% down. I didn't even have to put 3.5% down. And then there's, you can do the portfolio loan that I was saying, you can do seller financing. And the th- other thing is if you're doing a rehab, you can you can go to a commercial like line, go to a product in which they will give you 80 to 85% of the after repair value, which we are buying right now. So there's so mm-hmm. many different kinds of products that's available out there in which you really do not have to do you know, you do not have to bring any money in, to be honest. So, yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like the way that you kind of did this was you just went out there and started talking to people. Yeah. And I think that's like the biggest step right there is you don't know what's out there until you start looking for those opportunities, <clears throat> talking to your bank, talking to your underwriter, talking to real estate agents or just other investors is going to be the best way to go about this. Like you can't, you're not going to find all this stuff online. You might be able to, but. I think having like that face-to-face interaction goes so far. Like, you know, uh, you said something and it, it just clicked on me because uh, my, you know, usually you close a property in two months. It took me four months to close the first property that I did. And I'll tell you the reason why, because being an IMG, being from outside, the banks don't like to lend you. It's what I realized. I had to call and I had a log of it. I had to call 100 lenders to get the loan for the first property I bought. And I'm not kidding when I'm saying that. It's just... Uh, a lot of people would give in, like give up during that time. You're like, hey, it's not mm-hmm. meant to be. Um, I'm going to take my earnest money deposit and, and I'll be okay with it. But I just don't know why. I mean, that I think when you have a very strong why that, hey, I want to, I really want this because my why is so strong. So if you really want to make $1 million a, a year, you will, you will lose it. You won't make it unless you have a very strong why. So I think I have a very strong why at that point. Um to just go out and make 100 calls. So for anybody out there, you know, if you're trying to, if you, if you want to, if you have a strong why, you can achieve anything you want to. 
And you also mentioned too, that you paid 0% down for the house that you're currently in interviewing for this podcast right now. So I'm assuming that this is through what is kind of, you know, the coveted physician loan or healthcare loan that's available. So can, can you explain like what that is exactly and who would be available to it? Yeah. So I think a lot of, uh, so I think med students are available, residents are available, fellows, uh, physicians who are out less than five to 10 years from training. And then uh, the, also from, from what I've spoken to, some of the physician lenders, they do it for nurses, NPs, pharmacists, RTs, because I teach a lot of house hacking to those categories. And they're like, yeah, 100%, we'll do it for them. So mm -hmm. basically, um, it's 0% down. You have to live in it. Similar six months to one year. And then um, you do not have any PMI as compared to FHA loan in which you have a PMI. The other thing is it doesn't take into consideration in your debt to income ratio that you had a student loan. So if a, as, a, as a resident, for example, uh, if you are a first year resident, you definitely have a student loan debt, right? You, you, unless you, you're lucky and you've paid it off in med school, but most people have a student loan. So when they do the underwriting for you, every time you take a loan, any bank will calculate your DTI. The physician loan people do not take your student loan monthly that you have to pay as a DTI because they know that you're going to start making money as an attending and you'll be okay with that. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Mm -hmm. And then you can buy a prop up to four unit building. So you don't have to buy only a single family with tons of rooms and rent everybody a room. That's a great strategy if you want to do, but you can also buy a four unit building. So what I did was I bought a three unit building and I live in one of the units and rent out mm -hmm. the other two units. So the first one I was like at four unit, now I'm at three units. Wow. And so that's basically the term is house hacking in the sense that you are living in the unit the, and then the rest of your renters are the people that you have occupying the other two units end up paying for your mortgage and for you to live there. And then you cash flow off of it. So that's essentially the same idea right there. Now, how do you go about like finding quality tenants in the first place? I, I think that's something that everyone's got a horror story that's like, oh, I had a bad tenant or like Joe Schmo down the road, you know, told me that they had a bad tenant. So you should never get into <laughs> real estate. So how do you kind of confront those Unfortunately, things? Unfortunately, we only hear the bad stories. You know, we have like hundreds and thousands of tenants in each city, but we hear about that one or two Joe Schmoes, which, which had a bad tenant. But the the way, yeah, I'll be honest. I had like, I have so many tenants right now. I don't even know everybody's names and um, where they are from, but they are, they're great. The the way you do is like, you have a proper diligence, due diligence process. Like once you, if you're trying to apply for a med school, they do a due diligence on you. So same thing when you apply for a, a tenant, like when you are trying to screen your tenant, you screen them well. There's ways to do that. You know, like I, I'm sure you, I don't know if you have a property or you rent right now, but when you rent it, at some point you had to give your credit score, you had to give your background check done, you might have to give your employer stuff. So you check all those things first. Make a strict criteria. I usually give up a bad tenant to keep my property vacant and then wait for the better tenant to come in to live. So that, that's one thing I've always done. I've never taken a bad tenant. If somebody has an eviction record or criminal record, um, it's just my policy. It's not discrimination. I just don't want to uh, have a problem later on. So that's that's just, um, I think, and as a medical professional, um, you can always outsource it. You know, you, you don't have to do all these things. I've done all these things now myself, so I know how to do it. So it's easier for outsourcing. But you can always outsource it to a property management company or a real estate agent, and they'll do that for you. Of course, too. And I think that's also something like once you start to kind of build out this idea of like, oh, well, I could just outsource it to a property manager. Well, then I think that also opens up a ton of doors when it comes to what areas you're investing in. A lot of people kind of have this like narrow minded focus where you're thinking I can only invest in the same town that I'm living in right now. And it's of course, that's going to be the best place to look if you you know, know the area and are comfortable with like kind of understanding the market that you're working in. But there are, that might be the worst market, you know, in the Eastern seaboard. And so, but like, oh, that's all, you know, so that's where you're investing. And there's a lot of opportunities in other areas too. So kind of having these property management skills or having like the idea to outsource to other companies or individuals can lead you to kind of even growing your portfolio much faster and scaling up. And uh, I'm curious to know, like, what's your perspective yeah. on that? So one thing I'll tell you is like one of the big things why it works great for medical professionals is we live close to hospitals. You know, 
hospitals drive so much people to come to work for them whether it's residents medical students with nursing students nurses we have 50% of our housing maybe even more uh, occupied by medical professionals and uh, that is um, a great and if a medical professional comes to you and they are actually trying to talk to whether it's you or the person that you outsource and they want to know about the landlord and they tell them that hey he, that person works in the hospital that's a thumbs up for them you know they are interviewing you as well so um i think based on the perspective that you were asking outsourcing is is a great idea for somebody who doesn't want to do it um however you can translate the medical skills that you've learned you like the people skill that we learn in medicine is insane it's really good because we get to talk to so many different people every day and if you think about other jobs that's mm-hmm. going around right now you think about tech you think about uh businesses banks they don't talk to that many people as as we are talking you know if if i think about one shift i do in the er and i'm seeing like 20 30 patients that's 20 30 different families i'm talking to apart from the nurses residents med students other doctors that's a, that's probably like 30x of the number of people that we are talking on a ba- everyday basis so we are pretty good with people and generally physicians medical professionals are like nice people they're credit worthy they 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 take care of the properties really well and uh you do a, mm-hmm. i think i love to like talk to my tenants when i first started i just don't have time to do that anymore so um but i love to know about them and uh when they talk you come as very very genuine person like most medical professionals are it goes a long way wow i i think that's so cool and i mean like that's something that i would love to do myself too is like i think about all the clerkships that i've done in other cities or other places and your sub eyes i'm like why is it so difficult to find some quality housing for these like learning opportunities and it sounds like this is like the perfect avenue like there's obviously a need for yeah. it and like you said the tenants are going to take care of the place they're they're so busy working their 90 yeah. hour shifts in the hospital that they don't have time to to mess yeah. up the place yeah and <laughs> i mean you know um they're in the hospital so if you think about the background check that i was talking about before the hospital doesn't take them doesn't take a medical professional just like that you know they have done drug screening they've done blood tests they've done a lot of background check so that's like one check big check mm-hmm. box that you have when you try to get medical professionals in your housing and so kind of i guess like talking a little bit more so you've obviously had uh, a great relationship with real estate and it has really rubbed off on you know the way that you've wanted to take your professional career and so you loved it so much that you started to get involved in the consulting business so what kind of prompted you to create a business around real estate yeah so it's more about like helping people house hack you know i'm very very passionate about um teaching med students and residents so i translated from like the er uh whenever like when i was in fellowship i got an award for the the best educator uh in the er and then i was as an attending i always was teaching med students and residents and i got great feedback on them and uh i just came across that i always wanted to teach people and then this was a good uh, the more i learned about medicine the good and the bad about medicine the more i learned about real estate the good and the bad about real estate i realized that there's a way we can combine the two and i love uh, teaching whether it's attending residents fellows med students re- respiratory therapists nurses about house hacking and i've mentored around 55 people now who have gone through the process of learning about house hacking some bought it some are trying to buy it right now and it's great to see when you like follow up with them after a year or two and they're like this has changed my life because it's just not that deal it's just not that house hack but what it does after so imagine like just give you an example of me saving 2300 dollars a month on my first property that i bought just that in a year is around 30000 dollars and that can go a long way to invest in your next next thing and you might not be doing 30 you might be doing 10 you might be doing 5 but that takes a long way and if you put that 10000 or 5000 towards your principal of a student loan debt that goes a long way too so it all started from just mm-hmm. like it uh the need for for it like there were so many people who reached out that um it's it's a lot of it is free like a lot of it is in the website a lot of coaching is free and a lot of videos are free uh it's just a six week coaching that we go through or one on one um but i i just i love talking to people about it i think it changes people it's changed my life big time and i think it can change a lot of people's life 
Yeah, there's a there's a really good book actually that m- it makes me think of it. It's um I think it's by Austin Kleon and it's uh, called Show Your Work. And it's one of those things like as soon as you learn something cool or amazing, the best thing you can do is then turn around and share that with the world. And it sounds like you're doing that right now. So I think that's yeah. amazing. All righty. And so to kind of finish out with our like real estate mm-hmm. discussion at this point in time, what does your portfolio look like right now? Like how many units and doors do you have? And where would you like to be by the end of 2024? I think we have eight buildings. And um, it's kind of a mix of small multifamily building, like um, multi-unit buildings, and mm-hmm. then some Airbnbs. I have one build- one unit, which is a condo in India that I just bought in 2023 uh, for my parents to live in. It's it's an asset eventually. You know, I'm, I'm going to probably rent it out mm-hmm. uh, later on in life. Uh, but I think it's I think it's a mix of I would say I would say around like 20 30 doors I have to count it but um but yeah six or seven buildings we have we have two under contract right now and uh, I'll be honest I mean I slowed down a lot in 2023 um with with the, all the negative thoughts that were going around all the negative talks that were going on in real estate it, I did buy two properties then but um it's um yeah I think the biggest, that was my mistake, you know, I, I'm happy to admit it that, you know, when there was, um, I, I was in that, that one thing that I try to tell people not to do is follow the herd mentality. So I kind of like give into that. I was playing very safe in 2023 when I, when I've seen in my life, my biggest upside has always been when I've taken risks and I've t- think I've thought about risk mm-hmm. as an opportunity, like coming to the U S by alone with an address was a risk. You know, buying my first house hack, um, moving from city to city to city uh, to do training and to, to take a job in New Orleans where I didn't know anybody. I had no relationship in New Orleans. So it's always been the risk. So I, I 2023, I did not take enough risk, and but I'm like all on throttle right now in 2024. I do not have a number of units that I want to get to the end by 2024. You know, I don't look at the number of units. I see, I look at number of amount of cash flow that I can generate out of, out of a year. And when you were saying like, you know, kind of the dangers of real estate, you're referring to like possibly like the market kind of making a turn for the worst with like the interest rates and stuff like that. Is that yeah, what you're referring I mean, to? You know, um, there was a lot of talks about depression or recession, you know, a lot of talks about the real estate values going down, which did, you know, New Orleans was one of the big places where our home values fell by 9% year over year. Um, Mm -hmm. And the interest rates were high. So it's the same, uh, you know, $200,000 property that you can pay like $800 a month. If you have a 3.5%, you're probably going to pay like 1500 now if it's 7%, you know, so if the interest rates are doubled, the cash flow is kind of difficult to happen, but that's when you do more reps, Mm -hmm. you know, when like, so you can relate that to going to gym, you know, um, when you're trying to lift, like when you're back squatting 225, you can't do it the first day. You need to start with 135, 185, 195, then you go to 205, 225. You got to do your reps. Same thing happens when, when things are tough in anything in life, like in real estate, uh, you have to do more reps. And I feel like I didn't do enough reps in 2023 for that. Um, so I think that was the biggest thing in the the market changing, the interest rates. There was a lot of lot of noise going around in 2023, and also uh, my personal life had changed a little bit. My I was trying to buy a house for my parents in India. Uh, that took a lot more capital than I thought it would. And then uh, we did a lot of travel. We were traveling for like 72 days out of 365 days in 2023. So that was fun. So I wow. think trying to balance a lot of like, <laughs> hey, it's all about finances, business, to being like. Oh, there's finances, business, there's medicine, but there's so many other priorities in life. And um, I, I don't want to say balancing, but I want to say it's more about like thinking what's important at what, at what stage of the life. Yeah, I think that's a really good philosophy to have. And like, you don't have necessarily a number of units that you're looking for, like, you know, because there's always once you get like 100 units, then you know, what's the next yeah. milestone at that point? And so there's always going to be something more. So I think... Um, I had an interesting discussion with one of our fellow podcasters the other night uh, about, you know, like just kind of being happy with the process and where you're at right then yeah. and now. Don't like worry about the the goal at the horizon. Just kind of like live in the moment. And I, I think like it sounds like you're doing that for sure. So I think that's amazing. because a lot of people live in the gap and they don't live in the game. If you've read about that book, The Gap in the Game, that's what happens. When I was in, in 2020 or 2019, somebody told me that I'll have like 30 units by the end of by 2023. I would be like, no, 
that's that, you're kidding. You know, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I've never bought one property. There's no way I'm going to have that many. So we always live in, in like the, we, uh, the or we, we have to try to live in the game. Look at that. And uh, I think that's, that's a cool way to live. Fantastic. Well, we're getting close to the end of our interview today and it's time for our, fi our famous three questions. And these are the same three questions we ask every guest who comes on the show. So question number one, how do you maintain a work-life balance in your demanding profession? And do you have any other tips for others striving to achieve the same balance? Oh, wow. Work-life balance. Um, I think I'm very passionate about that because I think the idea of work-life balance is like often misunderstood. It's not like just clocking in and out at a precise time. It's about maximizing your impact, uh, both in your personal and, and, and professional life. Um, I, I don't think I, I think about it balancing. So here's the deal. I think uh, these are the three, I, if I have to, somebody told me these three things and I thought I, it stuck to my, my head about balancing the work, work life. So these are, the, these are the three things you can do. Get ruthless with your priorities. So you cut the fluff, identify the 20% of activities that bring in your 80% of your results and prioritize them like your life mm -hmm. depends on it. Uh, you know, a lot of us write so many, so many things, but you, a lot of things are just fluff. So identify your top 20%. Then um, set your boundaries, you know, uh, set a time, like for me as well, like I am, if I don't set a boundary, I'm going to come from work, I'm going to do real estate, when I'm going to spend the time doing other things for life, like spending time with somebody or talking to somebody, you know, so you have to spend your t set boundaries. When you're doing work, you're doing work. When you're doing uh, fun, you're doing fun. Don't get your phone involved. Don't st start scrolling up and down. And the number three thing that helps me a lot is uh, self-care. You know, you, despite how busy you are, you have to take care of yourself, whether it's, uh, I, I believe fitness is a big thing for myself that's helped me the most. So whether it's like getting a, going to the gym, meditating, or just like, you know, cold plunge or sauna, whatever the, the new, the new craze that is right now, you know, those things like help a lot. So in my mind, like you can have, you can have, you can have it all, you can, you know, but you have to be intentional about it. And once you, once you get intentional about it, your, your life is going to like, uh, basically scream in front of you. Yes. You achieved everything. You achieved your work life path, which you didn't even think about you were achieving. Those are all excellent points. I, I love it. And my second to last question, do you have any last minute recommendations to students or graduates interested in pursuing a career similar to your own? Yeah. I mean, the number one thing I'll tell, uh, students graduate is do the reps, you know, um, think about, think about number, think about your, uh, your, your purpose in life. You know, your profession is what you got trained for. You train, you train to do, you train to become a pharmacist, you train to become a doctor. That's your profession. You were trained to do that, but your purpose is what you were made to do. Once you like uncover your purpose and, uh, that will help you guide through a fulfilling life. So, figure out your purpose in life. That's the why that I was talking about before. Figure out your why in life. Uh, that's your purpose. And then then do everything around that purpose and uh, do the reps, create a network, um, talk to people about it. Most medical professionals love to talk about things that they've done in life and share stories. So um, those, are, those are the big things I will tell you. Like start with the purpose, your why, uh, network with people and then do the reps you will get what you want. And our final question, and I know we've kind of touched on the, some of this stuff already, but what are your personal, professional, or business-oriented goals that you would like to accomplish in the next five to 10 years? Oh, wow. I'm like a big goal person. So <laughs> you asking me that is like uh, amazing. I'm like, I have, a, I have a book that I carry with me all the time, which has my, my five-year vision come down to one-year vision and then um, everything after that. But for five-year, it's like uh, pretty simple. Personally, married uh hopefully with a kid I'm, I'm engaged right now and then we travel outside the u.s for 90 days in a year health is 10 years below the chronological age i, I check my health um, from inside tracker every six months so just make sure that's 10 years below chronological age at that point professionally still be able to do four to six pediatric er shifts a month but on my own time um basically trying to do like uh, mm -hmm. 1099 and then business wise i want to help a thousand medical professionals a year on for house hacking and then I have a, I, like I said, I do not need, care about the number of doors I have, but I, I have a portfolio which covers like a, a X amount of revenue with not more than four hours of my involvement 
in a in a month. So I, I love to outsource stuff. I have like right now I have four VAs who are doing most of the work while we're sitting over here. So I love to outsource this and, and that's the eventual goal. You know, you don't get into real estate to take another job. You're already doing a full time job. So <laughs> think about how I can also do it. So those are my, uh, I would say my 10 year goal and I, or five year vision. And I kind of look at that every day. It's very important to look at that. Yeah. I, I think that's really cool because you're, you're mindful of it and those are very ambitious goals. So, and the cool part about it is that we're talking about it now, but I know for a fact that you're going to achieve those. I, I'm really excited to see where that, that goes. And hopefully I'll be joining with getting into the real estate industry myself. I, I, I mean, anytime you, you want to learn anything about it. One thing I'll tell you is like people overset their goals for a year and under calculate the goals, what they can achieve in five years. So always that's, that's the biggest tip I can t tell anybody who's trying to set their goals. You can achieve anything you want in five years. But you, you try people always, when you see a one-year goal, um, that is very overdone. So have ambitious five-year goals and then break it down to a year and then a quarter. All righty. So we've come to the end of our interview today. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners for the support. If you have any additional questions about the medical school journey, non-traditional careers, or entrepreneurial topics, you can check out my website at www.physicianpharmacist.com. Before we let you go, Dr. Gupta, how can our listeners get in touch with you or learn more about you? Yeah, so mdhousehacking.com, that's the website that we have. Um, there's information over there. You can contact me, email me from there. And uh, that's also LinkedIn. The same same name is on LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, so yeah, follow us for anything. All righty. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast tonight. I really do appreciate your time. I know you're extremely busy. So um, I think this is just terrific. And you offered plenty of amazing advice that I think is going to impact a lot of people. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate your time. You're doing a great job doing this. I wish I did it when I was a, a med student or, you know, uh, so I'm glad you're doing it for everybody right now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank Take you. Take care.